The following is a Shaw TV public affairs presentation. Constituency Report is produced as a public service by members of the BC Legislature through the facilities of Shaw TV. Hello, my name is Judy Feinstein. I'm Director of Operations for Andrew Weaver, MLA for Oak Bay, Gordon Head. And I'm delighted to welcome Andrew to the Constituency Report. Andrew, it's been a busy time in both the legislature and in the riding with community concerns. Overall, how are you feeling about your role as an MLA? It's incredibly rewarding. It, it's got to be the most rewarding profession that's out there, is you're able to represent your constituents, help them access the system, and to be able to br bring and raise issues, bring to and raise issues in the legislature that uh, um, are important to you and to your constituents. It's incredibly rewarding, so I'm thoroughly enjoying this position. Excellent. There's lots of important issues and events to discuss today, so let's jump right in. The fall session of the legislature has just ended and it was mainly focused on the bills tabled by the government around liquefied natural gas. In your response to the throne speech, you spoke about a vision for the 21st century economy. In fact, we have a short video of you speaking in the House. The fact is this government has no backup plan. We have staked our jobs, our health care, our education, our debt repayment and so much more, all on the gamble of an LNG windfall. But I ask you today, what if the LNG industry is correct? What if we only get one or two LNG plants? What if those plants aren't realized until the mid-2020s? What if we don't get the windfall this government has promised? Is gambling the creation of new jobs, the adequate and sustainable funding of our education and healthcare systems, and the repayment of our debt on the back of, of, uh, uh, of a risky promise the right thing to do? More importantly, is it demonstrating real leadership? I don't believe that to be true. Our challenges are too big and the consequences too profound to ignore the evidence. We need a new vision for BC, one that begins with true leadership, leadership that is grounded in the courage to be honest with British Columbians, to recognize our overzealous promises and to move forward responsibly. Well, we've just heard that short clip from you speaking in the House. And Andrew, you also tabled an amendment to the throne speech. Can you tell us why you felt it was important to lay out an alternate vision and what the amendment was about? Well, it's very easy to criticize. We all know that uh, you, you can stand up and say, I don't like something, but it's much more difficult and frankly much better to actually provide a constructive alternative. The throne speech, uh, very short, basically outlined government's agenda, which is LNG, 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 and some more LNG. And you know, our economy is not only about LNG. So I put an amendment forward which suggested that we not only think about LNG, but we think about a diversified sustainable economy that includes a reinvigorated education system, that includes uh, sustainable industries, that includes opportunities for our youth in areas of growing interest worldwide, like the clean tech sector, like the high tech sector, like the biomedical engineering sector. And, and, and so that was the purpose for me doing this. Mm -hmm. And Andrew, you're the only MLA that has intervener status with the National Energy Board regarding, regarding the Kinder Morgan proposal. Can you describe what that means and how that process is proceeding? Yeah, this is uh, the Kinder Morgan uh, National Energy Board hearings. It's been going on for about six, seven, eight months now. And uh, we applied for intervener status because it's in critical for the con constituents of Oak Bay Gordon Head. That is, the proposed uh, increased shipping of heavy, heavy oil, diluted bitumen, Dilbit, uh, across our beautiful landscape would happen on a more than daily occurrence. And, and, and people are troubled about this. So I, I with my team, we divvied up the uh, 10,000 pages. We read it all. We read every page. And we posed many hundreds of questions to the National Energy Board hearing process to try to gain some insight. Um, I thought it was a responsibility, my responsibility as the MLA to do this. And, and I was, frankly, quite surprised that no other MLA or, or, or political party actually had uh, in British Columbia actually took the opportunity to do this because ultimately we're elected to represent our constituents and it behooves us to be part of a process to represent our constituents. It's a frustrating process without any doubt, 
because uh, you don't have cross-examination, because the questions uh, that I pose are, are in many cases getting inadequate responses. But nevertheless, it is a process that I've promised to commit myself to mm -hmm. uh, working through um, in the rest of this year. And in the event of an oil spill, what capacity is there to recover? Well, that's one of the beauties of being a participant in the hearing process is the answer is very simple. There isn't one. Diluted bitumen, <coughs> which is going to propose to be in these tankers, is a product which in the presence of suspended sediments has the potential to sink. Um, we know there's no shortage of suspended sh sediments in our waters. You just have to look at the color of the water emanating from the mouth of the Fraser River and you mm -hmm. see it. So, so, and you know, the, the, the whole hearing process, what we found out is that even the worst case scenario that is being discussed by Kinder Morgan, which is not, which is assuming traditional techniques like skimming uh, would work, that oil would float, even there it's only accounting for a, a mere fraction of, of the oil that's contained in a, in a tanker, mm -hmm. something of the order of 16,500 uh, relative to 120,000 uh, barrels which are being carried. So it, it's only a small fraction that, mm -hmm. that would be um, dealt with in any scenario. Mm -hmm. And considering the recent events on Burnaby Mountain, mm -hmm. do you think that Kinder Morgan will be able to earn the social license needed to build the pipeline? Well, it's, it's pretty clear to me that uh, since day one, the Kinder Morgan Trans Mountain Pipeline has been losing social license uh, every time you pick up the newspaper. Uh, we, we have a, a situation where they've argued against cross-examination process in the National Energy Board hearings, which is against what people want. We see the protests on, on Burnaby Mountain, and we see, you know, uh, Kinder Morgan taking regular citizens to court and, and uh, suing for the tune of $5.4 million for uh, damages. I mean, this is, this is, if anything turns people against a company, it is this. And then we see the, one of the greatest, uh, um, you know, debacles of all. We see an injunction being put in place, and then we find out that Kinder Morgan submitted the wrong GPS coordinates to the injunction, so the people who were arrested for crossing for in, in contempt of court couldn't be in contempt of court because the GPS coordinates were wrong. I mean, if, if we can, cannot trust a company to submit the right GPS coordinates to get an injunction, how can we trust them in terms of a you know, multi-million litre spill of diluted bitumen in our coastal waters? Uh, frankly, I think social license has been lost. Mm -hmm. And to switch gears here, I know that education is a very high priority for you. Let's watch this short clip where you address this, and then can you please explain why this matters to you so much? Imagine if we trained our graduates to retool the BC economy for 20th century industries. British Columbia has a highly educated workforce that is prepared to take up the challenge and capitalize on the opportunity that transitioning to a 21st century economy presents. But to ensure that this workforce is sustained, we need to think carefully about from where it comes and whether or not we are valuing and considering carefully enough the intrinsic link between our education system and our workforce. I committed this summer to make education my number one priority. In fact, it should be everyone's number one priority. The education of the next generation is the foundation of our society. If we want responsible and educated citizens who can adapt to a changing world and a changing economy, then we must ensure that our education system is being properly resourced and that teachers are properly supported. I find the claims that we have six years of labour peace with teachers to be greatly and profoundly misleading. What we have is six years to completely reimagine the relationship that exists between government and teachers. We must use this time to engage all stakeholders and figure out how to create the trust between these partners that has been missing for far too long. We must also ensure that the education system is properly funded. Teachers, without any doubt, are the single most profession in our society. To burden them with unsustainable working conditions is to do a great disservice to such an important profession, a disservice that is in turn extended to our children. The government has made choices about how education is funded. At a time when GDP has grown in BC, revenue to government has not kept pace, and we have seen funding for education fall as well as a percentage of overall GDP. I think it's time we make a different choice. By demonstrating real leadership in BC, we could have renewed focus on returning to a truly progressive taxation system. The same leadership should be used to have an honest conversation with British Columbians about how we currently fund education and how we can ensure that adequate funding is restored to our schools. 
Can you explain why education is so important to you? Well, Judy, as I outlined in that talk there, is the foundation of any modern society, of any society, is an educated society. The whole purpose of education is to inform people so that they can participate in our democracy. And, you know, the future of our society is in the hands of those who are the children of today. So I cannot imagine a more important profession. I cannot imagine a more important um, element of our economy is the, than the education sector. Uh, they train the next generation of citizens who will be the foundation of tomorrow's economy and will take care of us when we're older. They'll be the doctors of tomorrow. They'll be the teachers of tomorrow. They'll be the shop stewards of tomorrow. They'll be the welders of tomorrow. But they have to be trained. If we don't train them, I think we're, give it, we're, we're essentially not doing what we should for the generation of children today. Yes. Now, there was protracted job action by BC teachers this year, and you heard from <coughs> many constituents and many others around the province about the teachers' strike. How did you respond? Well, as, as I said in the, in the clip, uh, to me, education is the single most important issue uh, for me right now in this province. Uh, and, and, and so I took it upon myself, one, to respond to every single email that I received from every constituent, every teacher, every person in British Columbia. A lot of time there, but I, I wanted to, to let them know that I did care about this issue and I was listening. Number two is, is that I met many times with, with various stakeholder groups. I also uh, started a couple of petitions. We also did some press releases trying to get the government to, to uh, recognize that uh, you know, the people, they're losing support of the people. One of the things we did is we called for binding arbitration uh, and the BCTF shortly thereafter also uh, said that they were willing to look at binding arbitration. So we worked lock and step uh, trying to guide this process on by informing people, not, 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 uh, not you know, it's taking sides for the sake of it, but, but supporting good arguments, recognizing that people want kids back in school and that it should be the first priority of everyone, and, and trying to outline a process there through engaging people when they corresponded with our office. Uh, you know, I, I, think, I think we were successful in, in at least helping people feel that they were heard in this process. It was a lot of work, but it was incredibly rewarding. And what do you think is the best course of action for labor relations between the BCTF and the provincial government? You know, we should be starting right now, and this is what I would propose we, we be doing, is not thinking about another crisis six years from now, but taking a look at some other models in North America, particularly Manitoba, which have had many decades of labor peace, which have much better funded education system than we do here, and ask the question, what have they done differently that we, we, that, that from, from what we're doing here? So that, that's a discussion that cannot be done with a, a end of contract looming. We have a number of ways of doing that. The government could strike the uh, committee, uh, Standing Committee on Education to ta start to explore this now. It could start to bring stakeholders together um, now. And not only sh can it, it should, because otherwise it's going to repeat the cycle of, of, of distrust, the cycle of, of labor, labor unrest, and, and nothing is ultimately solved. Mm -hmm. And, you know, even, Judy, with the present settlement, while people think we have six years of labor peace, what we do have is we have six years of teachers who feel undervalued in our society, six years of bad morale because of the way teachers have been treated in the last uh, uh, you know, few months over this. This is not good for education when you have the morale of teachers in our, in our community um, not up to what it should be. And I, I think it behooves us as legislators to actually fix that. Fix that not by just throwing money at the problem, but by engaging teachers in real meaningful dialogue as to how we can make their working conditions better. And there are ways of doing that. Mm -hmm. And we will return after a short break.
welcome back to Constituency Report. I'm here with Andrew Weaver, MLA for Oak Bay, Gordon Head. Now, Andrew, you often speak about the importance of engaging youth in our democracy. Why is it so important to you? Well, if we look at the federal election, the numbers that I have the most statistics on, only between 30 and 40 percent of our youth vote, whereas between 70 and 80 percent of people over the age of 65 vote. Now, that's great that our seniors are voting, but it's not good that our youth are not. So I've given many, many talks over the years in universities, in schools, in elementary schools, middle schools, uh, in uh, public lectures. And invariably, um, you know, when I'm talking about things like climate science, people ask the question, what can I do? And well, I say, well, there's a couple of things you can do. You have the power of the pocketbook, et cetera. But you can also engage yourself in our democratic systems to try to um, you know, elect people who have your interests, um, uh, first and foremost. Because mm -hmm. the decision makers of today are making decisions whose consequences they will not have to live. Yet those people who will have to live the consequences are not actually participating in our democratic systems. So I, 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 I think that's critical because if we're going to deal with issues of intergenerational equity, issues of, you know, mitigation aspects, for example, with global warming, uh, you know, it really is irre an irrelevant issue to the seniors of today. It's hardly relevant to, to me because, you know, I, well, sure, I'm in a decision maker now, but most of the consequences will be born on the next generation. Mm -hmm. But it, that generation is not participating. So. I've been told in these talks in these, uh, 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 that people feel that there's nothing to vote for. And so obviously I, I always say, well, no, if you, there is. You run yourself, for example. And at one point I practiced what I pro preach but because um, I felt a hypocrite otherwise. But, but you know, there, the, you, you are beginning to see um, change happening. And I look to our recent civic elections here in, in BC. I, it, in Victoria, the vote was way up. And Oak Bay Gordon had in 2013 when I ran, we had a 70% voter turnout. Mm -hmm. It was phenomenal because we got the youth engaged. And, and, and um, I think we tend to ignore them. We tend to talk about issues that they're not relevant to. So I encourage my, my colleagues to talk to issues as well that are relevant to these youth because they will come out and vote if you actually make it relevant to them. Now, you've started over recent months a series of articles on your website called Celebrating Youth. What is it all about, and what inspired you to do this? Well, this is great. I, Judy, I, you know that I love doing this with you. We do this together, and it's the idea came from actually from a teacher uh, during the a teacher's labor dispute who, who sent me an email and said, you know, it's, it's sad that all we're hearing about education is the, this, the negative aspects. And there's, you know, I've got so, taught so many great students who just go on and we don't hear about that. And I thought, you know, we chatted together, Drew, I thought, you know, wouldn't it be nice if we actually reframe this rather than focusing on the negative, which is so easy to do. You can complain, you can complain, this is bad, that is bad. Let's focus on the positive and let's try to show people what the amazing potential is, the amazing things that are being done by the youth all around us in our community. So we just started with a, a, a one young woman from Stelly's High School, and since then we've done a dozen of these, and we're, we've got, we've, as you know, Judy, we've interviewed a bunch more, and we'll have them coming out every week or two through the year, just focusing on some of the amazing, uh, uh, wonderful um, contributions these youth are doing to the community with the hope to inform the people of the community of what's going on around them, number one. Number two, to show that the youth voice is relevant to us and to show others that the youth voice is relevant because they are doing so much. And it, it, it's got to be the single most rewarding part of the job is to sit there once a week, you and I um, meet some young person from a high school here or a university student in a local coffee shop. We interview them for an hour and are just blown away at what they've done. And I, you know, I just cannot cannot put it into words at how 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 um, inspiring these youth are to me I know to you as well Judy but I think to the broader community which is why we want to tell their stories mm -hmm. and what would you say is the single biggest issue or issues in the constituency <clears throat> an issue that we've heard a lot about is one that you might not expect it, it's not it's not you know, sewage treatment, it's not oil tankers, it's adolescent mental health and access to facilities for adolescent mental health treatment, particularly for people as they transition from high school to adulthood mm -hmm. because they fall through the system. There are uh, uh, processes in place as, uh, for dealing with um, children with uh, mental health issues uh, in high school, in elementary school, in middle school. 
you become 19, you become an adult, you fall through the cracks. And so this we hear from many such groups, from groups like Moms Are Us is one local group who's met with several times, from parents themselves who are, don't know what to do, um, from, from, from youth as well. So this is something that we've tried to help people on a case-by-case -case basis, but also trying to work on a community level with other MLAs to ensure that in our region there are facilities, better facilities that adolescents and as they move into adult, uh, adulthood that these young people have access to appropriate care facilities. Mm -hmm. And of course the appropriate support systems needed as well. And I know that you communicate a lot with your constituents and it's a two-way communication. What steps have you taken to communicate with the residents of Oak Bay Gordon Head? We've done a number of things. Um, <clears throat> of course, as a traditional town hall, we've held a number of town halls where mm -hmm. we tend to focus them on issues, although the last one we had was more of a, this is what we're doing this session <clears throat> town hall. Uh, I think that's a good opportunity for people to have their questions answered. I, I've gone into Monterey Senior Center and engaged um, uh, seniors there. I'm going in again uh, soon on that. I've obviously gone to local functions, but, but What's most important to me is that we've done a lot of engagement through social media. Mm -hmm. In particular, we have a very v vibrant and active Facebook account, uh, which is, I always respond to comments. Uh, I, I think it's a, a critical job of an MLA to respond to the comments on their Facebook page. And, and I get a lot, not only from Oak Bay Gordon Head, but from all across British Columbia. We have a very active website, Andrew Weaver MLA, where we put lots of uh, posts up, everything I do, all my votes I do, I justify them, I provide background information, <coughs> we provide other information for the community there. We have a newsletter which we encourage people to, um, to sign up for and it's not a newsletter every week, it's about once a month and it kind of highlights some of the key articles that uh, as a team we've put together. And, uh, and of course there's, there's email. Um, we don't do a lot of newspaper advertising, I, I, I don't know that that's effective. Um, what we do, we, we, we typically do most things electronically um, because we find that reaches the largest demographic, um, whether it be senior to, to junior, everybody seems these days to have Facebook uh, or email access and, and so that's been our focus. Mm. And you do your own social media responses. I, I do. I do not, uh, you know, I do all my own comments. I, I, that Facebook account is the Facebook account that I like to look at. I do my own Twitter. I know that's not terribly common, but um, I think it's important because you know, people elected me. They didn't elect um, someone to write uh, Facebook comments on behalf of me. They, they elected me. And so that, I treat this as a very important component of the position, which is communication with the constituents through the various media that we've, we've got available to us. Yes. And looking forward to 2015, what will the priorities be for you and your team? Well, 2015, you know, this is, uh, we're looking forward to the um, upcoming session. There'll be new legislation there, of course, that we'll be uh, working towards. We're also starting to flesh out, and I've got some amazing volunteers come down, flesh out this 21st century diversified sustainable economy. And you'll see more of that being released as the weeks and months move forward. Uh, you know, it's not just th those are words that are easy to say, but there's got to be substance behind them. And we do have that substance, and that substance is beginning to be fleshed out and we'll put it out. You'll see us take a very um, uh, a proactive approach to homelessness and uh, social housing uh, that sure should start to emerge uh, in the month of December um, through until the new year and we'll see, see a, a number of posts, um, ideas there, had a number of meetings already and some more planned in this area. So, so you'll see us fleshing out a lot of this 21st century diversified economy, uh, a lot of the um, social issues uh, that are common in, in, in this region and, and obviously continued Kinder Morgan and um, dealing with the legislation and you know ultimately as well doing what we are elected to do as well which is representing and helping individual constituents, constituents access the system and uh, deal with problems that they bring to us. Mm -hmm. So looking back since you were elected in May 2013, has the role of MLA turned out to be what you expected? It's been far better than I could have possibly imagined. Uh, as I said right at the top, this has got to be the single most rewarding profession anywhere, is that you're able to actually help people make their lives better. You, could, you give them a voice. I realize you can't help everybody in the way they'd want it, but it is incredibly rewarding to be able to 
have the honor to, to, to serve the people of Oak Bay Gordon Head, to bring their voice to the legislature. But it's also fun. Uh, as you will know, Judy, it's important. For me, humor is critical, particularly when you work in the legislature. If you don't have a good sense of humor, you're not going to last there very long. Um, so I have a great group of people I work with. Uh, they have a great sense of humor. We make the most of every day and, you know, find the lightheartedness in various aspects. You know, I'm getting voted down uh, 84 to 1 or 83 to 1 on a particular issue. Some people could be totally dejected. I, I come down, talk to, with the... With the folk in my office say, well, there we go again, 83 to 1 is another good, good, good win for us today. So, you, you know, we, it, it's fun. And, it's, and it's, it's, un, it's, it's a great position to be in because the BC Green Party is a new party. It's not constrained by the tr tradition of, of old parties, by backroom politics. We're doing things differently as a group. We're, we're learning as we go along, but we have, we, we have some amazing talent of people coming to work with us these days. Well, it's clear that you enjoy your role very much, and it's many aspects are enjoyable. But can you give us an example of what you find difficult about the role? That's an excellent question. So the most the most difficult aspect of the role really has to do with trying to understand. It's not so much difficult physically. I mean, it's a lot of work. Of course, you spend a lot of time, but it's trying to understand how individuals can survive in traditional political parties where they're told how to vote, how I can look some of my colleagues in the face, have amazing discussions with them. There's good people on every side of the House in the legislature. And to know that they believe something deeply, yet they go and vote it precisely against it because they're told to do that. That's tough for me because I could never do that. And, it, and it's tough for me to, see, to, to look at these people and say, how could you do that? That is something that I don't understand, how somebody could vote against their fundamental principles because someone told them how to vote that way. And, and, and so then, I mean, that, that I just, I don't understand that. It's just, it's incomprehensible to me. And um, it's probably the greatest challenge I have is, is being able to continue to look at these people and talk to them with respect when I know that they just voted against their fundamental belief system mm -hmm. oh, for pure political reasons, not representing their constituents, purely political reasons. Mm -hmm. So despite those difficulties, you do uh, overall find this job incredibly rewarding and enjoyable. Is that true? Absolutely. I, uh, you know, I can say it's been two years, 2017 is coming fast. Uh, I will be seeking the nomination for Oak Bay Gordon Head again in 2017 if the people of Oak Bay Gordon Head will allow, allow me again. It is just such a rewarding position. I would love to have an, another opportunity to keep this going. Yes. Well, it's been terrific to have a conversation with you today. I've really enjoyed it. And thank you all for joining us for Constituency Report with Andrew Weaver from Oak Bay Gordon Head.